Today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com slash rogue. Sign up for a free trial. And when you do sign up for the service, use promo code rogue at checkout. Get 10% off and make us look awesome. Like your thumb. What happened to your thumb? I didn't use Squarespace. <laughs> All right, so these are fencing swords, right? And this is how fencing looks? This is a, a legitimate fencing? This is how fencing really looks. It, okay. All those things you were doing before was less fencing than this is going to be fencing. So it's a lot like conducting an orchestra, but people get hurt. It is. It is. Yeah. Except yeah. your arm's it's, more tired It's a afterwards. murder orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. Murder <laughs> orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. symphony yeah. of murder. The death symphony. Yeah. All right, we are here at the Austin Historical Weapons Guild with Anthony and Bryant once again. Gentlemen, tell us what we're going to be learning today. Actually, I'm going to let Teller take control of things. We're doing rapier today, so. <laughs> there it is. He's going he's to act out all so, of the moves. We didn't bother miking him. <laughs> so I am going to walk you guys through a little bit of rapier, right? So we're going to talk about Salvatore Fabris. He was a rapier master from early 1600s, late 1500s. He wrote this book that was published in 1606. So the goal of rapier, as opposed to all of your other weapons, with anything else, it was basically hit them kind of however you can, right? You can cut them, you can slice them, you can poke them in the face, whatever it is. But this is specifically, rapier only works if you poke them, if you skewer them. I will say it only works if you poke or skewer them. However, it primarily works best if you poke or skewer them. So really it's the structure of the body that really leans into rapier. And the goal is to set your opponent off of the line so that they can't stab you with your weapon, which very clearly is intending to stab them. So is this specifically like, a, I don't know, like a gentleman's duelist kind of sport where it's like neither of you are using the more effective murdering weapon uh, specifically so that you can mock each other with, with your talents to, to knock the stick away? Rapier was very much a gentleman's game. It was very much uh, a style game in many regards. Uh, there was a lot of honor to be had in the rapier game because if you can pull your rapier faster, and you get there first, they may not even have a chance to draw, and that's absolutely humiliating. This is like having a big Twitter following, <laughs> like back in the day. It was more of a civilian's weapon than it was a military weapon. And, you know, when you have a long antenna that you're waving around, it tends to not be very effective when the other guy has, you know, a spear right. or something like that. Okay, so maybe not quite nobility or military, but someone with money. Usually someone with money. I, I have a lot of conceptions about rapiers, like I'm supposed to stand with one hand behind my back and right. stand upright, you know, and, and hold the blade out like this, and then you repost. Different style. That's very that's different style. It. That's getting into the stress, uh, which is not what we're talking about today. Right, yeah. right. Okay. And I'm going to <laughs> totally destroy all of your preconceptions about how rapier fencing should actually look because Fabris is a very different style. Is it a particular time period or a particular class? Or? So Fabris was kind of on the tail end of this uh, Italian rapier style that was much more kind of squared up. It was much more structured. The style that we're looking at ends maybe mid 1600s. Immediately after him, and even kind of in his time period, they started getting into more of a like lunging style where you really exposed yourself and really committed to this action, yeah, right? And that, it's kind of what you think of. That's what you think of, you know, that, that really far yep. out stabbing action. 99% of the time, we're not gonna lunge. Okay. We don't lunge in fibers. Um, Don't means sometimes, but don't mostly means don't. Yeah, right. what prompted people to use the rapier as opposed to any other weapon? Longsword, which was maybe the 1300s up through some of the 1400s. It really started kind of phasing out somewhere in the 1400s, right? And the metallurgy improved around that time as well. And so we're able to make longer, thinner blades that are also lighter. So we're able to have the length of a longsword wielded in one hand now. I won't say it was easy to learn how to use, but because it was very focused towards that one principle of let's poke him in the face, it took a lot less training, right? To really master, to nail down. We got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So because this is primarily a thrusting weapon, and most of my job with this is to poke people, we're gonna have Jason wear glasses. Brian is already wearing glasses. Right. We're gonna hope that both of those pairs of glasses actually stand up to being poked. Nowadays, you got this kind of bowy action where it's, it's, it's like an antenna. Is mm -hmm. that the way it always was? No, not necessarily. So you'll actually see that mine, if we, if we compare swords, oh, geez. is yeah. a little bit shorter. It's like but you'll also high. notice it's not as bendy, right? Mine's very bendy. I don't get as much 
flex out of this if I press it against something. This is a little bit closer to what you might expect kind of in the time period. It might be as long as that, but this is designed for safety right? Because we're training with these. I will go ahead and let you know one of the things that we are not going to cover because it is really not recommended is cutting. We're not going to cut with these. In the manuscript, it's explicitly like cutting is a waste of time. Right. Cutting. Oh, really? Right. Yes. He describes how you might cut if you're in the situation where all you can do is cut. However, right. he does say that he who masters the cut and he who masters the thrust, if they were to fence each other, the person who masters the thrust is always going to come out on top. What are all these parts? This is different uh, from uh, the usual swords we use. This is, what is this called? The basket or something yeah, like that? Yeah, the basket hilt, cup hilt, it's anything like that. I've got the weak of my blade. I've got the strong of my blade. I have my hilt, which is basically everything below the end of the blade here. Here, I have a clamshell. In another rapier, I might have a cup, which is just sort of a solid piece of metal that wraps around. I happen to also have a style of rapier that includes a swept hilt. It's really just kind of a cover. It's almost as much a decoration as it, as it is functional. I have my cross guard here, just like in a standard sword. In addition, I have my grip and I have my pommel. Now, is there a different way we're supposed to hold the blades with our hand? Because yeah, I, I was yeah. looking at what you were doing. And so as I go to hold this sword, I'm going to sort of back it up against the heel of my hand. We talked about that a little bit in some of the other swords. Mm -hmm. When I wrap my fingers around, I'm going to shoot my index finger through this top loop and I'm going to hold it kind of like a trigger. Oh, shoot. I didn't that's pick that. Yeah. 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 I saw you doing that and I thought, hmm, yeah, that's so, new. That's so, different. And then I'm going to wrap my bottom fingers around. You'll notice that I now have kind of a pulling power with that index finger. It's like a trigger finger, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Right. So okay. this is a pistol grip. And my thumb just sort of relaxes here on the back of the blade. I'm able now to sort of squeeze that index finger and raise my point very easily. And I'm able to drop the heel of my hand and do the same thing. So I have a lot of control over the weapon based on how my hand is oriented. Oh, wow, okay. Right? So also in other weapons, we kind of talked about you always want a straight line from your elbow to your hand. You want this unbroken wrist, right? In rapier, if I'm pointed at Brian, right? My tip, my point is actually going over his head if I maintain that same line. And so I'm going to actually break my wrist now so that my elbow to the end of the rapier forms a straight line. Does that imply that if you're trained in the rapier, you would be stronger in the lower part of your, of your hand so that you could do the wrist action? Not necessarily. Um, a lot of holding the rapier comes from a whole body structure that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. Oh, that sounds complicated. <laughs> Every part of any human body structure starts from the ground up. So we're gonna talk about feet. Other forms of sword fighting, they all kind of spread out of grappling. Right? You can imagine with a really long antenna stuck on the end of your arm, we're not going to come into grappling distance as often. It'll happen, but it's going to be uh, much less pronounced than it would otherwise have been. It's probably going to happen. <laughs> it's, I guarantee you it's going to happen. From here, we're going to pretend that we're going to go into a grappling stance and we're going to work it narrower from there. Okay. Okay. So a good grappling stance is feet together. You're going to widen out a little past shoulder width so you have a nice wide base. Take our left foot, we're going to scoot it back about a foot. Now I'm going to bend my knees and I'm going to set my hips back like this. So Oof. if oh anyone does... So you, you're, you're going to feel that in, in the hamstrings. You're and, really going to feel it in the hamstrings. So yeah. is anybody familiar with Good Mornings? No. So Is that a talk show? Daytime talk so show? I, I just don't know mornings in general. <laughs> Nobody can handle mornings here. He's got a Garfield so. mug that says that. <laughs> Anyone who lifts weights is going to be familiar with this action where my feet are together. I have a, maybe a barbell here okay. and I'm going to, with more or less straight legs, throw my butt back and bend forward, right? Okay. This is really good for the hamstrings. You can feel it stretching this out. This stance is like good mornings, but forever. We're going to narrow this back foot a little bit. What I don't want is to be so wide that I can't proceed forward easily. And I don't want to be so narrow that when I move, I cross my feet. Right. So I'm going to bring this in maybe half a foot and then I'm going to allow my back foot to be turned anywhere from straight forward to 90 degrees out. I tend to settle at about 45. So we're here. We have our butt sat back. You'll notice that I am not shoulders also going back. I'm very forward. So I'm going to kind of suck my diaphragm into my back and tighten that straight line down my back. All of this is really important because when we pick up the rapier, we might have to hold it for a really long time, right? Especially if we're training. 
And so we want as much of this base here as possible to help me hold up that rapier. So light as this is, it gets to be really heavy when it's the weight on the end of the long lever that is your arm. Oh, sure. I'm gonna pick this up and I'm gonna hold it straight forward. We'll notice that almost everybody has their shoulder sort of pressed forward. Right. Bearing the load of that weight is stopping right about here. Your arm's gonna get really tired really fast. So I'm going to roll that shoulder back and I'm gonna feel the weight bared mm -hmm. in my back and my lats. And if I have a good deep stance, I should feel it kind of above my hips. Yeah. Right? So the other thing we're gonna do, we're gonna take our offhand. Our offhand we actually use, we're gonna pick it up, we're gonna put it <laughs> next, we're gonna put it next to our face, and we're gonna pick our elbow up and roll it back as well. Wait, wait, wait. so we're like, we're, like we're a whole Hogan, Hogan thing? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. You'll notice both of my shoulders are now externally rotated. What that does is it engages both halves of our back and allows the left half to pull some of the load off the right half. Both halves of my back are actually working together to hold up this rapier. Take a lot less effort. So I'm sort of seated into this position. Now, the one thing that I wanna change about kind of everybody's stance is I wanna roll this elbow in, downward. So right now my elbow is facing kind of to my right. I'm gonna roll it like this. Oh, this is that stereotypical, you know, you've got, you've got your elbow up. Oh. Got it. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah, so your elbow is a hinge. The hinge is designed to bear load in two directions. It pulls and it pushes down. So if I'm here and I have this weight at the end of this lever, I'm gonna use my elbow and the correct orientation of this hinge to help bear my rapier. So the idea is make your entire body spread out that effort so that you, because the moment the moment you drop down, you're out of the game, right? right? Everybody could just get you. So you want to be able to hold this for 15, 20 minutes at a time yeah. straight, right? which is harder than it looks. Now, you only <laughs> need it. difficult. You only need it for maybe 45 seconds. Sure. But you need to be able to hold it up for as long as is necessary, just in case, right? Each of you is going to have a line. If I am here, and I'm holding my rapier forward in the stance that we just talked about, I have a couple of different ways to move forward. Uh, the primary one that most of you will be familiar with is what we call a simple step. We move the front foot forward and the back foot follows. Right, so I'm here. Now you have the rapier like extremely straight the entire totally time, straight. never moves. Arm is fully extended, okay. the rapier never moves. Ideally it never even wobbles. Uh -huh. It's less prancy than I thought it would be. So now, you're gonna go backwards. So your back foot is gonna move first and your front foot will follow. Yep, right? So that was your front foot first? Oh, back foot first. Back foot first, right. And what's the purpose of the back versus the front first? So, if I am here, as my back foot moves first, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna throw my hips backwards. This allows me to move very quickly out of the way. Because even if my feet never move, I've gained a couple of inches. Okay. I leave. But if I pick this foot up as I do that, I get a little bit more distance and now this foot follows and maintains my balance. And I would imagine also that the opposite, like for example, if you brought your back foot up, like this isn't a very rooted, strong position to be in. If somebody steps offline, if they leave that path straight down your middle, it's very easy for them to just sort of push you off. If Got it. your feet are together. I won't say it doesn't happen. There are times when it's appropriate. However, as a rule of thumb, you generally don't wanna be here. It's very precise. It's like every inch matters and every second because the fight is yes. really, really quick. It is Thank incredibly God, because I'm a sprinter, not a marathon runner. <laughs> not a sprinter either, actually. <laughs> so speaking of sprinting, the next step is a passing step or a natural stride. I'm going to step forward and I'm gonna maintain kind of the angle of my foot. Ah. Oh. So if you're at that 45, you should stay at the 45. Stay at 45, doesn't hurt anything, Hold right? On. So this is natural. This feels a bit unnatural, but I assume, again, what we're doing is we're keeping a wide base. Right. And if your foot is turned out like this and your hip opens, you'll find that it's much harder to take a longer step and it's much less natural feeling. So take a smaller step. So it's even just here, right? And the other thing you'll notice as you move that back foot forward, if it's a small step, you feel tension in your hips. The way we resolve that is by taking the next step, right? However, that tension is a chambering. It's a chambering action. And so I produce this potential energy to then release it, Got it. as I'm passing through the next step. Here, uh -huh. 
here uh -huh. and then keep on going? Yep, right, and just kind of keep moving forward. So make those steps smaller and make sure that the width that you started with maintains itself. Oh, you know what? I can tell when I'm doing it right, when I feel that tension never leave my quads right. and my glutes and my hams. It's all in the legs uh -huh. and nothing is moving up front, right? That's correct. The focus is a measure. <laughs> so the goal of this is to not pause. So the goal is smooth, natural kind of rolling gait. And so if I do this sort of in front of you, I'm gonna be here, I'm going to, and you'll notice I never rise. Mm. Only my feet are moving. Mm -hmm. As we're here and we have this nice wide stance, you'll notice I can kind of shift my weight back and forth. As I bring my back foot forward, I can still kind of shift my weight back and forth. This sort of centered weight is really important, especially as you're moving. Stepping forward, I'm leading with my hips, so I'm pushing sort of my hips forward. And if I exaggerate it, it looks super wonky, right? But if I make it really small and it's just sort of a little kick, I can walk very smoothly. My hips are leading, not my shoulders, and I'm not kicking my foot forward. We're hammering on this because it's critical later. Keep it smooth, keep it rolling. Yeah. So most people's idea of fencing kind of comes from this modern Olympic fencing background where we have this really deep lunge, mm -hmm. right? Or even deeper, where that leg is straight in the back and they're very posted up over this front foot. Instead, we're gonna keep doing exactly what we're doing and we're just gonna walk that point in. So the reason that we do that is there's this thing called flinging the sword. Flinging the sword is when I, with bent elbow, jab my sword forward. Watch my point. Yeah, use this one, right? You need a really solid. Let me use the wobbliest sword. Not the wobbliest. It really <laughs> flops around, right? Yeah. If I jab like that, and I have a really fine, small target I'm trying to hit, I might miss. It also looks like you're denying yourself a few more inches of length because it's flopping down. Right. If I add my feet into that, I create a really unstable motion. So if I'm here and I... Oh, wow. Yeah. That's dramatically yeah. different. And that could make the difference between getting someone right in the heart versus, uh, you know... A glancing blow. A glancing yeah. blow, yeah. Right? A small tip off the arm or something while the other person has their point in your throat. So we don't fling the sword this specific motion of my arm extending without my body is a jab. Okay. So we don't jab. So instead, if Anthony is my opponent and I start in position, then as I advance forward, we'll find that I'm just gonna walk this straight in and the orientation of my blade actually sets his point offline so that it doesn't poke me in the face. Oh, that's great. That's why the rolling natural gait is so important. If I'm advancing against Anthony and I have these long, deep strides. Oh yeah. It's very easy for my point to wave around. He sets me off. And now I'm over committed to this huge motion of my foot and I've gone too far. So I always want these small controlled steps where I can change direction if I want it. This is the surprising part. I thought the rapier was all about the wrist, but it, so far it's not about the wrist at all. It's all about the footwork and the hip work and the, and the, the full body posture. We're totally gonna talk about the wrist in a second because okay. it is in fact, all about the wrist. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. right. Everything else builds up to where your wrist can move. You need to be able to bear the sword. You need to be able to move with the sword. And then you can move the sword. So I'm going to try and make the tip of the sword move without lifting my whole arm and without moving at the shoulder. So without picking my sword up like this. Right. Let's see what you guys got before I even tell you how to do it. One of the things that our students so slowly discover over time is that they don't have a lot of awareness of what their wrist is doing and how to manipulate only their wrist. And so you build up this thing called proprioception. It's the awareness of what your muscles are doing. As we're here, I'm gonna lift my wrist and only my wrist. And so I wobble the point up and down by just moving my wrist. And I can move my wrist more and less for more and less motion from the point. And I'm never leaving the fight to make those things happen. Hold this in place, okay. move your wrist. Just like that? Yeah, like only move. So think oh, about move the there. wrist, not pivot the wrist, got it. Yeah, right. so don't even like lift this so up if you can. It's about. isolating this, yeah. So moving the wrist. Even less. In space. Small, tiny, right there. 
man, that is a fundamental change. Like I was thinking of yeah. moving oh, from wow. the wrist, but yeah. you're actually moving the wrist. Yeah, the wrist is what moves. <laughs> One of the easy drills to demonstrate is if you push your fist into my hand, Yep. all you need to do is move your wrist up and down, maintaining this contact. Uh, okay, so if I want my wrist to go up? Yeah, but don't move your whole elbow. Okay. Just move this joint, that. Oh yeah. And then no. move it left and right, yeah. Oh my gosh. And it's getting yeah. that kind of connection. Now make a circle. Uh, uh. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you can feel your shoulders starting to move. Yep, yep, uh, I can feel it all back here. So roll that back in. Yeah, now to do that same thing with the sword. Okay. Left, right. Boy, it really changes it when you're looking just at the wrist and the sword is just the after effect. And it's still about maintaining that straightness. Wow. Yep. That's amazing. Right, all you're doing is moving the end of the lever. This bone on the top of my wrist that I'm focusing on just kind of moving up and down and in a circle and left and right. Well, it goes back to that, like the archery and shooting, uh, aim small, miss small. If you're moving this as little as possible, you are increasing your precision. Right. So that's how we're gonna move the rapier when the tip of the rapier needs to go somewhere other than where it is. Okay. Very tiny motions as opposed to, oh God. If I am here and I'm in this position that we've been sitting in the entire time, I'm gonna roll it 180 degrees so my knuckles face up and I'm gonna roll it outwards. I'm gonna roll it counterclockwise. And I'm still gonna keep it straight and in front of my face. So this position really, really strongly depends on your shoulder being locked back. And so I have, I have to loosen my grip a little bit, but my trigger finger is here propping up this blade. Now, how much of it is hanging on your thumb or, or is it my all just the grip? My thumb is always grip? very relaxed. Okay, so this is all just in the fingers. Man, this is really taxing on the arm. It is, yeah. Yeah, it can be, especially if you don't keep everything locked back. Yeah. Uh, there all we the are. way, oh my gosh, like Back. over rotate. Yeah, yeah. All the way, so, so, so awkward, lean there. right? Got so, it, so like a stabbing kind of Pull that shoulder thing. back. Okay. That, oh right. So now make sure that the front of your hilt is as close to in front of your face as possible. Because if I'm walking straight at your face, you need the only protection you have right in front of it. Right. From this up facing position, which we call the first guard, I'm going to roll into the second guard. I'm gonna turn my arm 90 degrees. Yep, so now the knuckle edge of my blade is facing to my right, it's facing to everybody's right, and the flat of my blade, where my palm is, my palm's facing down. Okay. Right. So this is second guard. Roll 90 degrees so that we have our edge down and our knuckles down. Okay. This is third guard, so this is the position we've been sitting in while we've been talking. Okay. Now another 90 degrees so that our palm is facing up, our knuckles are facing to our left, extended arm, this is fourth. So we can have sort of in-between positions, which we generally name after the guard it's closest to, right? If it's immediately in between, call it one or the other. It doesn't really matter. These are referred to as, I believe, Garius Bastardius or something. They're bastard guards. When the opponent's blade is in front of us, sometimes you'll be at a kind of wonky angle instead of 90 degrees to the clock face, right? So what's the rule of thumb between the relationship of your, of your guard position mm -hmm. to what they're holding? As a general rule of thumb, wherever they are, you want your index finger to be pointing towards their blade. So he's sitting in a sort of third, right? Right. If I'm on this side of his sword, I'm going to point my index finger at him and find myself in fourth. Roughly perpendicular? Right? I'm kind of perpendicular to this. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm higher, Instead of match to the same distance, if I'm a little bit higher, I might be rolled a little bit down. Okay. But this is still mostly fourth. If I'm to the outside, I'm gonna point my index finger and arrive in second. Quick review, knuckles up is first, knuckles to the right is second, knuckles down is third, knuckles left is fourth. To help you remember first, think my sword is sheathed. I draw my sword into its most natural position, which is knuckles up. So I'm gonna draw my sword like this. Now we can actually get to the fight. Because now we know how to hold the weapon and hold ourselves. We're fully trained. We're ready. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> These rules are called proceeding with resolution. Okay. The rules of proceeding with resolution. So I'm going to set my mind to the target and I'm going to proceed towards it with absolutely nothing but the intent to hit it. The first rule is advancing forward, arm extended with a smooth natural gait. He is threatening me, I am threatening him. If I maintain my position and I move first, I'm gonna come here, you'll find we've met, right? And I'm gonna walk this straight through so that my cup sets his blade off, I don't have anything to worry about. 
I'm just going to keep walking straight forward, right? So we already did the first roll, right? Way at the beginning. Full passing steps. Yeah, there we are. And come back. Good. Remember, small steps, no lunges. Good. Excellent. There we are. OK. So all parties have this mastered. I expect total success later ha! as both of you advance like this toward each other and just stab each other in the face. Everything about your posture is going to maintain itself. We're still here. Our butt's still back. Our knees are bent. We're balanced between our feet. But instead of this extended arm, we're going to bring it up to our face like this. Remember being a bear from the dagger episode? Sure. I remember with the rondel. Yeah. So now what this does is it squares you up to your opponent. Normally we don't want this because it looks like we have a giant opening here, yeah. right? This giant opening is actually really important and we do want it because with my sword here, I've locked anything Anthony can do from outside my sword, right? He can't do anything from there. So he only has one target area, which I can control now. I can predict exactly what he's going to do next. So if he goes through the center target area, I'm just going to wind my shoulders. You'll notice I'm not pressing. I'm keeping my arm in its chambered, cocked, ready loaded position, and I'm just turning my shoulders. Man, that's such a difference because I'm tempted to just, you know, punch forward with my arm, but that would uh -huh. throw me off center. So instead, if you keep it rooted right. and you're just pivoting it yeah. out. At no point do you fling the sword. As you walk towards him, he should do this. So you need to be. Yep. Up so and your back hilt like this. is going to oh, be God. It's, right it's like next I to wanna, your face. I want to rush forward to meet him, but I guess that's not the nope, no, way. Not right now. Oh, believe me, I want to stab you too. <laughs> that's why we have glasses. Right? See, that, Don't that's press me that arm. too far forward. You're yeah. pressing the arm now. Yes. Now switch. And I'm maintaining the same position with my feet though, right? You can. You can or you can sort of set them on the same line. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Free but your turn. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So what we'll notice is that our point is nowhere near the opponent. And I just told you that we always basically want to be pointing at the opponent. Sure. We always want to be working towards stabbing the other person in the face. That's not happening here. What I'm doing is I'm provoking and I'm creating an opening, and I'm wanting them to travel through because if Jason walks in on me like this and I set this aside, now I can just lean and take my step. Oh, yeah. And notice my arm never changed where it was. Right. Right? My point's back online. There. <laughs> that was astonishingly natural. <laughs> it felt really good. Yeah. Don't extend the arm. OK, all right. So turn, lean, lean. Yeah. There we Dude, are. That felt good. What guard am I doing here when I'm holding it up like that? Does it? It's a third. It can be a third or it can be a second. Okay. It's easiest to remember third. Okay. Oh, Ooh, <laughs> little slower. <laughs> lean. Yep, yeah. boop, boop, boop. So he doesn't come up from underneath. He, he doesn't necessarily he need to. He's, okay. His goal is to set your blade off right. and put his point on. Ging. Got it. Where his point is online depends on where your nearest open target is. Slow motion so, fencing. There. Oh, I've been there. bested. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that was good. Rule two will come back to haunt us. Don't worry. Rule three, I'm going to start my extended position and I'm going to advance forward a little bit offline. This is where we start talking about inside outside lines. Anything that is, in this case, uh, to his left, to my right of the blade, is inside his line. So that's basically all of his body. Inside is where the heart is. Right. That, I saw that on a Hallmark card. Outside <laughs> is everything else. So if I'm outside and I have an advantage, I might be able to poke his shoulder. I might be able to poke his face over his sword, right? But I can't really get that opposite side chest. So you want to be inside. You want to be where the target is. From here, advance forward. We're going to pick the line that we're going to walk down. And we're going to walk a little bit to the outside. And just keep walking. You'll notice as he turns out, I have a better angle. Jason's going to start by walking. And he's going to angle very, maybe 30 degrees to the outside. OK, line. and I am aiming to what? Push him nothing. off? Nothing. I could do nothing. I'm good at that. Yeah. And remember what we said about putting your index finger towards his blade. Ah, yes. So as you're getting close to the blade, roll out into second. Oof. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you'll find that if done well, walking to this outside line creates a natural opening, often above the opponent's sword, as well 
you naturally sort of void off the line your opponent is on, right? You leave that line. And it's really just a matter of degrees. It's really it subtle. Is. So anytime we are sword fighting with any weapon, in fact, anytime we are working with martial arts, putting the other person off is not about shoving them out. It's not about maximum motion. It's about minimal effort for maximum result. You only move them enough. That is a really interesting reframe because uh, it's tempting to think of like knocking them out as useful, but it's not any more useful than slightly knocking them off. Right. And meanwhile, you've wasted your stamina bar. So you right. want to preserve your stamina bar and spend the least amount of energy. The more effort you put into something, the more likely you are to come offline yourself. Got to it. overcommit to an action and to put way too much effort into this, for example. Okay, so here, let me see if I can. Yeah. Oh, I'm still doing the wrong side. Because that's the side you did for me. I just realized oh. I'm mirror imaging. I'm here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like that? Uh-huh. That's fine. Keep that arm extended. Extended arm, extended arm, extended arm. No, right. Oh, that, that's terrible. So don't try to fight his sword. Okay. Just walk the point into it. Okay. Don't Again worry about what his sword is doing. Got it. I mean, could you that's just fine. do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's also valid. It feels like right. cheating. <laughs> I was like, I could just go okay. over here. The next part of rule three is learning how to relax. If you guys are this far apart from each other and you go into position, why? Is there a sword fight here? Is Not anything yet. happening that far away? Oh, that's interesting. So are we wasting energy by being prepped before we're even close? You're also telegraphing what your intent might be because rapier is a very fine art. It's a very nuanced uh, set of motions. And as a result, anything you do might give you away. And so instead, you're going to do nothing until you have to. Is there a nothing pose? I yes. Mean, I know I think we're about them. to learn it. I'm going to relax my sword. It doesn't really matter where my sword is. Chill guard. Chill guard. As I advance forward. It's my favorite bar in Skyrim. I'm going to wait until the very last moment to raise my sword. Now we talk about measure and distance. The distance at which I can simply lean to stab my opponent is what we call strata. It's close. If I have to take a step and lean, I am in what we call larga, wide. So misura, measure, misura larga, misura strata. These distances dictate the kinds of things that I can execute depending on how close I am. If I'm at larga, I can't simply stab him. I also have to take a step, which means I have to be covering the line, controlling the center so I can step without being threatened. We're gonna start in a relaxed position. Our opponent is gonna start in position. I'm going to slowly walk to the outside line. And as I step into this longer position, denoted kind of by the end of my sword close to his hilt, I'm going to raise my sword. It's so wild because it looks like you're doing an ostentatious uh, braggadocio move of swagger, basically. But in, in fact, what you're doing is legitimately conserving your energy until uh -huh. the moment it's needed. And I'm not telegraphing. A little bit smoother, it looks like this. And now I'm there. It's like how sometimes the second move in chess is better because you can tell what the gambit of yep. the where their head is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was too close. Ooh, that was good. You uh -huh. still are close, right? Ooh, and all right. you'll notice that as you pop that up, you're kind of jerking with your whole body and you're mm. pulling yourself out of position. Ah. So instead, think about just straight lift, right? And point your index finger towards their sword. Yeah. <laughs> it's fairly intimidating. Right? And now as you raise, keep moving forward. Don't raise and yeah. stomp, don't stop. Brian, don't get stabbed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's fine. Self protection. You? At this point, it's right there in your face. Yeah. So protect yourself a little bit. Okay. Right? Good. Set it off. It's okay. All right. As long as it doesn't disrupt what he's working on, totally fine. I still lunged. <laughs> but you know it, right? Yeah. You know what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right. Recognizing what you've done wrong is the first step to learning how to do something. Smooth, smooth, smooth. Uh... So don't worry too much about attacking his blade. Okay. Yeah. That felt better. That's much better. All right. Now just poke him in the side. Are you thinking left side or, or right side? I'm, th or? I'm thinking here. This is closest okay. to you, right? Yeah. So just don't even worry about his sword. Just no, don't even him. worry about his sword. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's well, you didn't proceed to the outside, right? Walk toward me. Okay. St no, no. 
Stay there. Stab him. Walk oh, toward me. Oh, hey, that's way easier. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's so hard to not fixate on his sword. Beep. There. Yeah. There there it is. Just it is. like, like that. jousting, basically. Yeah. The first half of rule three was walking to the outside. The second half was as you enter Misora Larga, as you enter wide distance, we are raising from a relaxed position very suddenly to take the line. Okay. Right? We are raising unpredictably. <laughs> rule four is how to actually use your feet to close a line. As I'm advancing forward in the style of rule three, I am here. I know that my next step is gonna take me into Larga, right? My tip is gonna be close to his hilt. So as I take that next step, I'm gonna be aware of what foot is stepping. If my left foot steps, I'm gonna fall offline to my left. So basically now, your hips are following whichever leg is extended. Right, my hips are open and they can now turn to face the sword, turn my index finger to point, and if he pushes on me, I'm very strong because I'm squared up in the direction of his blade. And now I just take that next step. If my feet are opposite. So I'm here, I advance. This next step would take me into distance. As my right foot proceeds, I'm gonna fall off to the right, even from the outside. And I'm turned into over my front foot. Now, the first time you were on the inside and you pushed out, and this time you're on the outside Both pushing in? Both times I was on the outside. Okay, I so started on the outside. You always want to start That's on the outside? That's rule three. You, you, want to, you want to do all, the line well, up to the Just all the yeah. time. Real thing. You, you might want to start there. One of the reasons for starting the outside line is if he's up and guard, and even if he goes into second, theoretically, he's much stronger in this position because he's pushing that direction. The problem is that the back of his shoulder, his rear delts are really small muscles. And even if he's got this locked back, in order to pull out to resist, he has to use tiny muscles. He's as opposed to the all, all the work comes from back here as opposed to the great muscles of his chest. If I push him here and he pushes against this, he's very easily gonna turn that out. And his hips are cocked and ready to deal with that. If I'm here and he tries to push out, push, 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 push. I'll put my, put my tip there. Even if I'm putting my tip there, like I can maintain structure despite the fact that my sword is bending and he's really straining. Not to add another rule, but keep him working from the back because the back is weaker than the front. Yep, the back is weaker than the front if you are coming from the front. Oh wait, is that a whole thing of like being attacked from the back and then you can... Right. Wow. That sounds advanced. That you're sounds right. like... You're yeah, right, because your back is yeah. stronger. Or, than or a... That's... <laughs> Always wanted to do that one. That's a thing. I right. bet thing. it People is. People do that in competition. Uh-huh. And then walk into the outside line. Yeah. Okay. And you'll fall off right. that line. Now Excellent. All right. Uh-huh. The left. Ooh, that was good. So that was good. One thing that I want to point out that we haven't done every repetition is bringing us back to an idea of rule three. I want to raise as I'm coming into Larga, which again is about oh, my yeah. point to their cup. We've been raising to the hit, right? At which point we have no control over the situation. There, the opponent's sword can do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. So raise at Larga to control the sword and then continue forward. Oh, so too cross soon. your feet. Just, just pick up your arm. You're still, you're attacking yeah. the sword. The sword will cover the line. Just pick it up. Oh, you okay? Scared. Oh, that's the cross. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just as four. Perfect. Exactly yeah. Exactly what you wanted to pick that up. We get the idea. We know what we're doing wrong. Right. And when we do it right, it feels good. We have a basis off of which we can continue practicing. So the four rules. Rule number one is advancing smoothly with a natural gait straight at the opponent with an arm extended. Rule two is this weird bear position where we just wind our shoulders and lean to control a line. And that's mostly to bait them in. It's mostly to bait them in because the only opening is right here, it's face or breast. Also, as we just saw, that outside line is really weak, so that really covers that outside mm -hmm. line really strongly. Third is walk about 30 degrees, really you're walking just past their outside shoulder in a relaxed position, after which, as you close into distance, into larga, we raise our sword up. Very strict raise. I'm just working to control the line. Remember, enough is plenty. Got it. We don't need more. Rule four is as we approach offline in a relaxed position, we pay attention to what foot is about to enter larga 
and we fall in the direction of the foot that's about to step. The problem with rule five is that it can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. Some of the ways it can be interpreted are very counter to what you've been learning. Okay. We can make it work regardless. It'll fit into the paradigm. There's a reason it's rule five and there's a reason it's in this system. However, we're not gonna talk about it. Okay. okay. Rule six is considered the most sophisticated and therefore the most effective rule. Rule six comes back to rule two. We kind of uh, forgot uh, about rule two. Rule two is the bear. I wasn't the bear. told there would be math. We kind of forgot about rule two because it doesn't fit into anything else. It feeds into rule six. Okay. I am going to walk very slightly to his outside line in a relaxed position. If I'm here, my next step would take me into Larga. However, I'm going to raise my sword as I go into this step, step into Larga, and I'm going to leave my hand exactly where it is at extension and continue this step forward with my body into oh. the position from rule two. You are ready for defense and you're in strata at this point as well, and right? And I'm extremely strong. Right. I'm, in, uh, I'm actually still in Larga because my point is right around his hilt. Still needs a step. Got right? it. Still needs a step, but he can't do anything from here. I'm past his point. And so I just walk this in. So when your point gets to about here, yeah. keep your sword exactly where it is and fall into your hilt. Oh, and then- uh, There, right. So now so that's the bear. distance at which that's gonna happen, right? Okay. And now whatever he does is not stronger than anything you can do. Here, try something. <laughs> perfect. You'd be amazed how often you can get off a kick in rapier. I, I believe it. Because the distance is perfect. So now you're a bear. Yes. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that was good, yeah. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, you very good. much pushed him down, right? Cool. Yeah. So, and then here, yes. and, uh, oh, don't lunge yet, or, right, or, or that, I do. Keep that point I go forward, to bear. take another step. I want you to advance with your arm straight, off at the angle, and the moment your point reaches about the distance of his cup, So pause. it never goes past, okay, got it. Just All pause, right. freeze. Coming up, coming up, coming up, got pause. your cup. Okay, so from here, you see how you've already started pulling back? Yep. So that's fine. So from here, now you're gonna take that next step. Right. You're gonna fall off this way, and you're gonna step into your sword. And now, you take another step. Take another step. step. Uh, oh. There. Okay, so it's bear stab walk through. Okay. Well, no, no bear, bear walk, walk stab. stab. Bear walk stab. So I'm getting close, getting close, getting close. Bear. And bear. Walk again. Right, Keep and then walking. walk stab. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Rapier is all about these controlled, small, nuanced motions. It requires very fine motor control. That takes time to build up, right? There's way less swatting and swiping than I anticipated. Everything you say I trust is right, but the animal part of my brain screams, what if I miss, what if I miss? All of this is designed to minimize missing. Got it. If you miss and you're in that position that you just ended in, you're past his point. Got it. What can he do? Can we see what it looks like after you've practiced and trained and know what you're doing? <laughs> yeah. No, right. absolutely. Show, show us not, all the rules, including rule five. I want to see the secret rule five. You don't get to see secret rule five. Oh, God, doggone it. Oh. Right? Yeah. Years of training is required for rule five. <laughs> okay. Is there something with chi and like- You have to hit operating level Thetan seven or something yeah. before exactly. you get to rule five. <laughs> Gentlemen, only one of you can have our daughter, the Duchess of Duke's hand in marriage. Now, what, is, what does she look like? Due to the death. Also, this <laughs> is a legitimate uh, thing that happened in Italy 400 years ago. Also, I guess we're a married couple in this scenario. Totally legal then. It's and encouraged. Fight for our daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it back up over here. That was very quick. <laughs> Anthony's grabbing the sword with his hand. I like that move. I see a lot of the bear collapsing. We're the guys in the back of the Street Fighter video right now. That's right. We're, we're just doing this over and over again. <laughs> My champion, Anthony. Crush him beneath your butte heels. Butte heels, that's a word. Ah! One for Anthony. 
Point Bryant! That was loud. That was a great sequel to Point Break. <laughs> Dude, the grabbing works really good. Good job, Bryant. Point Bryant. Two to one. <laughs> oh, you're resetting the score? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, no. Point Bryant. Bryant. Wait, Three. wait, maybe you also got hit? Ah. So do you both get points? You both get points. Everyone wins. Three to two. <laughs> Ah. Oh man, it's tied up three to three. Point Anthony. For the hand of our daughter, Myriad. Myriad's her name. <laughs> Myriad. She's many things, if not wonderful. What? Oh no. Both? Both? Four to four. For the hand. And also all the mineral rights in Upper oh. Italy. Wait, did you both get each other? No. Uh, 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 wait, Point so Bryant, ah. five to four. My champion is victorious! All right. We both lose our daughter. Hey, strip yourself of all of this. I'll take him myself. Also, we're no longer married, and now I'm going to kill you. I consider this a divorce. <laughs> you go kick um, him. Okay. Just, just, just walk up on the ground. Screen. Okay. okay. All right. Walk up on the ground. Say that. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. 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 It's really, that's I know it looked really complicated. It's, good point. it's really that simple. Um, it's really just um, okay. yes. And when you go so, in, just go in hard. I'm going to turn it off. Control of the center? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, he yeah, doesn't have the cardio. Sense. Stay low, stay relaxed. Okay, right. center right. is hard. He's right. going to hit you. Push your arm down. Hey. And keep hey, your that's, point That's advanced. Down. None of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vince. For 3,000 years, I've raised Myriad as my own daughter. <laughs> Whoa! Is that just do to see count? Oh, slices. This is rape here. We're stabbing each other. Oh, yeah. All right, oh. point for Brian. 1 0. Fence. <laughs> Did I not get you? Nope. No, you didn't. <laughs> Two. Two Questionable zero. point for Brian. Remember, round three. I'll take it. Fence. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, general rule of thumb, don't grab the rapier. <laughs> Par form. Okay. Reset. Fence. <laughs> he died with it. <laughs> Hold on, we lost the tip. Oh, whoop. Got, got real. All right, this is Abby here. Hit him with it. Two, one. Point. Fence. <laughs> Point. Point. I got you, you got me in the leg. That was a swing. Oh, it was? It wasn't a stab. All right, three to one. Fence! Be a bear. Oh! Boy. In the crotch. Three to two. My glasses are on. Let's Fence. see a tie. I have to do this. <laughs> yeah. oh. Hold. Uh, Hold. You can have her. She's not worth that much. I'm gonna take my six points and leave. Also, my glasses. <laughs> That was really good. Oh. I'm just going to stand here and not say anything funny because I can barely breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This was fascinating. It was hard. It was harder than I thought. <laughs> Mathematical. How does this feel compared to the others? The other ones were visceral and precise and you could rely on your animal instincts taking over. Everything made sense. This one, you, you really did have to think a step ahead and do the opposite, you know, think in terms of the risk. Not that we did a good job at all of any of that. And I kept forgetting the rule of Anthony in that, well, there aren't any rules once the blades start flying. And so when you were coming at me, I was like, you're not supposed to do that. You keep swatting my blade away. <laughs> the third time I grabbed the blade though, they did fairly call me out for it. If people want to learn all of this stuff, where should they head over to? Uh, we are Historical Weapons Guild. AustinHistoricalWeaponsGuild.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're allegedly on YouTube. I promise to get better about that. If you're here in Austin, you can come by, take some classes. How often do you guys teach rapier versus the other weapons? We have rapier one day a week, 
It's on Sundays. If you message us, we'll be happy to have you come in and take a look at what we do. And I'm going to assume that we've only barely scratched the surface of oh, all yeah. of this, right? I mean, oh, yeah. there, there are more than six rules. We only learned five. <laughs> <laughs> and every rule has a dozen variations and exceptions. Well, and especially like you were mentioning off camera that there's even special rules for when you're wearing a cloak versus all, all the other stuff. I can't wait to learn all this stuff. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Yeah. That was My amazing. Pleasure. Outstanding. <sighs> Very cool. I want to create a fan site, Brian. Are you a fan of something? I am a big fan of 70s TV sensation, Samson and the Chooch. Oh my God, we totally should do that. We need a fan site okay, for Samson no, no, no. and the Chooch. Okay, Samson and the Chooch has to have a fan site, but most importantly, it's got to look like super professional. It's got to look like it has award-winning designers behind it. It's got to be fast, easy, reliable. I'm doing an ad for Squarespace. That's great. <laughs> Good, do it. Squarespace makes it so easy. I remember at one point, I, I think she was nine years old at the time. My daughter wanted to do a website to save pandas, so she made a panda website on Squarespace. It makes it so easy to look super, super pro. Yeah, I don't want to have to write any code or anything like that. I just want to take my little gifts of Samson and Chooch. <laughs> Here's the important Those. part. What are you going to do when all of a sudden it becomes an overnight sensation? When it becomes the number one Samson and the Chooch tribute site, Wait, 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 you can't handle that on your normal private server. You need the scalability of Squarespace. Let's head over to squarespace.com slash rogue. Sign up for a free trial. Get 10% off when we... You know what? We are contractually restricted from doing any Samson and the Chief promotional material. We might have made 37 different fan sites for hacking the system, and yeah. that might have gotten us in trouble. It was a little sketchy. Yeah. You guys can help us out. Can you make a Samson and the Chooch fan site? And if you do, maybe you'll see some more of uh, Samson and the Chooch in the future. Yeah, you know what? That's the fastest way to get exclusive behind the scenes materials. We could do a whole episode of Samson and the Chooch. I think maybe we should. I mean, we're just waiting for, you know, a little bit of a fan site. Yeah. If only there was a fast, easy, reliable way to make it happen. Squarespace.com slash rogue, 10% off. The fans have demanded it. They have spoken. I mean, actually we demanded it. I we, guess we're fans. We asked. We're fans. Make a fan site for our TV show, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, treatises, treatises, treatises. Got it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I thought this was you did, like, <laughs> listen, right. this is out in, of control. In roughly 1808, there was a conference in Europe where all of them decided that the rapier was outlawed. And they saw it all signed the treaties. Wow. Yeah, I'm uh, lying. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I.